Uh, welcome to New America Foundation. My name is Michael Calabrese. I direct the Wireless Future Project here uh, at the Open Technology Institute at New America. And this is, a, of course, a, uh, an invitation uh, only press briefing uh, on spectrum holding limits uh, uh, in, in, and specific, and in particular, uh, in relation to the incentive auction proceeding. I think that's really the, the, hot, uh, the hot topic for today, although it has obviously a, a broader context as well. So um, there are, we're going to have a few, uh, a few speakers um, to make brief remarks at the opening, and then the rest of us, uh, uh, those you see here as well as a few others, will be chiming in with brief remarks and to handle uh, Q&A. And we really have uh, an incredibly diverse cast of, of, of company and association representatives, consumer and public interest representatives, really reflecting the broad ad hoc coalition that's come together to try to promote uh, competition uh, through this auction. In addition to folks at the table um, also sitting just off camera, but they'll hop on when they, it, you know, whenever they speak, uh, Mark Cooper from Consumer Federation of America, Peter Crampton, The Economist, from University of Mar Maryland, and, and, and uh, Greg Whitaker from Herman and Whitaker are also uh, right at the front table here. So we're, I'll, I'll just give some background, which is that we are one day away from the FCC's sunshine notice for the May 15th open agenda meeting, um, likely uh, a historic meeting that will address rules governing the 600 megahertz incentive auction and related issues of spectrum aggregation. The Sunshine Notice, of course, triggers a quiet period prior to, uh, to the meeting. FCC staff briefings on the items circulating have really helped to focus the final days of this months-long debate, but it has also generated rumors and misleading information. The purpose of today's briefing is to clarify those issues and clearly state the principles and policies that we believe are critical uh, to advance consumer interests in wireless broadband innovation, investment, and deployment. As we understand it, the major features of the current FCC staff plan for the 600 megahertz incentive auction that is circulating uh, with the commissioners are as follows. The FCC will auction the 600 megahertz band in 10 megahertz increments, five by five uh, fungible blocks, on a partial economic area basis. A bright line rule will apply on a P by P basis concerning eligibility to acquire low band spectrum in the auction. The FCC will adopt a threshold price level to be determined after a future notice and comment. And once that threshold bidding amount is satisfied during the auction, the FCC will then separate these fungible five megahertz blocks uh, into one of two categories, uh, a pool of reserved spectrum and a pool of unreserved spectrum. Carriers that exceed one-third of low-band spectrum in a PEA will qualify only for, uh, for bidding on unreserved spectrum. This by no means is, is a radical or exclusionary set-aside. Under the proposal, as we understand it, in each market, both AT&T and Verizon would be able to gain substantial spectrum regardless of any screen. Less than half of the spectrum in each market would be reserved for competitors under the chairman's proposal. For example, a 30 megahertz reserve in a 35 by 35 megahertz auction would permit the two dominant carriers to acquire at least 40 of the 70 megahertz, leaving the overall foreclosure of sub one gigahertz spectrum largely unchanged from its levels today. So this is hardly um, uh, a, a, a very, um, you know, severe limit on, on any participant in the auction. AT&T and Verizon, on the other hand, uh, are not pleased that this set-aside trigger will prevent them from completely foreclosing additional facilities-based competition. And that's pretty incredible when you consider they already control more than two-thirds of all low-band spectrum nationally and more than 80% in major markets. They are throwing every argument against the wall 
from threats not to participate to claims that winning anything less than 20 megahertz isn't worth the cost of deployment. Nothing, has, nothing they've thrown has stuck. We're happy to address any and all questions, but we want to focus on the fundamentals, namely the pressing need for and compelling public, public policy benefits of allowing competitive carriers to gain access to low band spectrum to advance the public interest in investment, innovation, and competition. Um, it's, it's very important, I think, to emphasize that all spectrum is not alike. As Commissioner Rosenworcel said in her speech yesterday at the Wi-Fi Forward Conference at the Museum, the TV band below one gigahertz is truly super spectrum, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound to cover huge areas more cheaply and to penetrate obstacles and see through walls. We'd like to begin uh, by discussing the ample authority the FCC has to address market power for the benefit of consumers. We'll discuss how the Spectrum Act expressly authorizes the Commission to adopt uh, general rules like this on spectrum aggregation. Um, with the FCC's jurisdiction and authority firmly established, we intend to review a few key pol policy considerations as well, including the value of low band spectrum for coverage in rural and in urban markets, the substantial risk of consumer harm from anti-competitive foreclosure by the two dominant market players, the likelihood of robust, even record-setting auction revenues from an auction designed that encourages the two dominant players to bid against each other, and the domestic and international consensus in support of reasonable spectrum aggregation limits that stimulate investment encourage innovation, protect public safety, and expand broadband deployment. We support the chairman's approach in general. If anything, the holdings limit in this auction could promote competition to a greater degree. Um, as our Public Interest Spectrum Coalition stated in an ex parte filing just yesterday, a better approach would be to ensure that all carriers can bid, but to structure the auction so that the dominant carriers bid against each other in all circumstances, driving revenues higher while promoting competition. To that end, the Commission should, and this is just you know, our view of some of the public interest groups, the Commission should at a minimum designate only at most 30 megahertz as non-reserve spectrum with the rest reserved to enhance competition. In other words, if there's going to be a limit on either category of spectrum in the auction, the cap should be on non-reserve spectrum available, available to carriers controlling more than one-third of the low-band spectrum in a market and nationally, and not on new entrants and competitive carriers seeking sufficient sub-one gigahertz spectrum simply to find a foothold to compete. So I'm going to turn it over now to uh, first to Chip Pickering and then to uh, Steve Barry and, and then Mark Cooper. Um, we ask that uh, questions be held for, uh, you know, until after uh, they speak for, for kind of our, our big panel of diverse uh, experts and interests here. So, um, so turning it over to uh, former Congressman Chip Pickering, uh, who really needs no introduction, but I'll introduce him anyways, currently the CEO of Comtel, so, and served six terms as a member of the U.S. House, uh, representing Mississippi's third district, as, uh, and as vice chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, from 2002 to 2006, and of course, as a, as a leader on the telecommunications subcommittee, he became known as an expert in telecom issues. Chip? Michael, thank you, and, and, and thank, I want to thank the New American Foundation for, for putting this uh, together. Um, I, I want to start uh, today, many of you all may have seen Ken Burns' recent uh, special on the Gettysburg Address as he tries to teach uh, students to memorize and to recite it as part of the civic history, uh, the, the always relevant uh, defining of, of such clarity and with such brevity of the meaning and purpose of our nation. A uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln started the address four score and 20 years ago. And so if you think of the meaning and the purpose of competitive auctions and what it has meant for our country for 20 years, we celebrate the 20th year of competitive auctions this year. And we have not four score, but we have four generations of technology 
of networks in the wireless uh, in the wireless marketplace that because of competitive auctions drove four generations of new technologies new services probably no policy has generated as much economic growth investment innovation and no policy has transformed our economy our way of life our our culture you could even say our democracy as much as competitive auction policy and we need to remind ourselves what was the the first purpose the beginning mission the first basis for for going to competitive auctions it was to end a duopoly in the wireless marketplace you had an incumbent and you had one competitor per market you had a du duopoly policy set by law set by policy and so for 20 years every auction since has been to have at, at the beginning up to seven per market every auction since has always been structured to promote as much competition for the rural, the regional, the new entrant, the mid-size, the large, for every uh, size company in the wireless marketplace and all of the people around the country that they serve to have multiple choices, multiple options, and that competition has never uh, been such effectively demonstrated to give benefit to our country. It was to clearly end duopoly and promote competition. So all the authority and all the precedent that the FCC has and Congress has granted is to not go back to a du duopoly. So I, I think the history is clear, the meaning of, is clear, the purpose uh, of what our competitive auctions uh, have brought to the country and why they were uh, brought uh, is, is, is if you look over 20 years, no one could argue both with the reason, the purpose, and the clear evidence of the, of the good it has brought to the, to the nation. So as we talk about competitive auctions going forward, I think we can summarize uh, that it is very clearly not the intent to have a duopoly reemerge, to reestablish, and to close out the great benefits that competition has brought. And so as we look at the specific issues of how to structure it, we think that the FCC and Chairman Wheeler is clearly within their authority, they're clearly within the historical precedent, and they have a clear purpose defined by two decades and four generations of technologies to show the benefit of competitive auctions. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Um, next we have Steve Barry the President and CEO of the Competitive Carriers Association, which represents the non-duopoly carriers striving to survive and compete in a consolidating mobile broadband marketplace. Well, thank you, Michael. And thank you to uh, New America Foundation for sponsoring the event. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Chip, good to see you again. Uh, I appreciate your comments, uh, four score. Um, you know, Mr. Wheeler, Chairman Wheeler, should be commended for keeping his eye on the bouncing ball. And uh, it's competition and competition policy is his number one priority. We share that priority. And uh, FCC has constructed what I think is a, a competitive auction. It's a conceptually a sound auction. Uh, allows every carrier to bid and every carrier to potentially win spectrum in this auction. And it's critical that every carrier get access to this ecosystem, the 600 megahertz e ecosystem. You mentioned... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, four generations, what we're moving into uh, uh, is a fourth wave also mm -hmm. because the services, the digital world services that are going to be provided on this 4G, advanced 4G and 5G networks are bring us in, bringing us into the fourth wave of, of competition uh, in, the, in not only the wireless but the telecommunications world. And um, it just, uh, and it's incredible that um, especially the AT&T suggests that the FCC doesn't have the authority to craft this auction the way they have. And, you know, I, um, I wanted to bring along the actual language. So, uh, you know, it's got a few uh, uh, blood, sweat, and tear marks on it because we fought hard to get this language. Uh, this was a language AT&T opposed during the House and Senate uh, process. Um, 
They didn't win. Congress won by creating a competitive auction authority for the FCC. And if they don't believe it, then go to uh, 308J and read the, the, the savings calls language in there, which actually strengthened the authority that the FCC had before. And I'll just read it because nothing in this subsection A affects any authority the Commission has to adopt and enforce rules of general applicability, including rules concerning spectrum aggregation that promote competition. And that's what we are here today. We're talking about uh, competitive auction that hopefully allows every one of these smaller carriers to continue to, to compete. And, and we did mention it's low, low value, I mean low uh, uh, band spectrum, and that's uh, critical for everybody. We do not want to create the same mistake we did in the 700 megahertz auction by freezing out small carriers in an ecosystem that they can't complete, compete with and can't get devices and can't build infrastructure. Um, I want to say thank you to the FCC for adopting our proposal of PEAs, partial economic areas. You know, the FCC default was EAs, economic areas, um, and, and, and even REAGs. 176 economic areas, uh, uh, even fewer REAGs. We propose CMAs, cellular market areas, 723 of those in the United States. But uh, the FCC said that complexity of the complexity of the reserve uh, reserve uh, reverse forward auction and for other reasons they were not going there so we had a compromise we proposed a compromise very much along the same lines as the structure of the auction setting 30 megahertz aside in reserve it's a compromise to accomplish all the goals and and we appreciate the FCC's taking the the PEAs Anything larger than a PEA would have been the equivalent of a regulatory execution of every small carrier in the United States. And so uh, the FCC should com be commended for having the, the guts to stand up and recognize that competition will flourish because of these small geographic areas. And it's a absolutely extraordinary when you think about it, uh, what AT&T's position has been and large carriers has been uh, on the auction itself. Um, not only the reserve, um, but the unreserved auction, every carrier, including AT&T Verizon, can bid in every market. Everybody can bid. And what is even more incredulous is the AT&T's proposal, suggestion, that this freezes them out. AT&T can actually bid in two-thirds of all the markets under this proposal in the reserve, the reserve part. So two-thirds of every market in the United States, AT&T can actually bid in, under the reserve. And they can bid in every market in the unreserve, as, as well as uh, Verizon, uh, um, not, two th not as mu much as two-thirds, but they can bid in, in the reserve markets. So we have a possibility of, of an auction that can actually bring as much on the reserve as it does on the unreserved. Uh, and it, everyone can bid as much as they want. And the, the way that the auction is, is, is constructed, once you get to a certain point, um, we're going to meet our expectations of revenue stream from the auction itself. So um, the local and national eligibility test is one, is one of the proposals we've made, and that is to make uh, the same, same arguments that the Department of Justice makes in a merger acquisition review. It should be a market dominance power, national market dominance power test, and a local market power test. And if you're uh, an AT&T or a Verizon, if you meet both uh, uh, either or, you can bid in those markets. And you still have a spectrum aggregation limit that allows every carrier an opportunity to bid and allows every carrier an opportunity to get in this ecosystem. It's just not about how much spectrum you get. It's about getting into an ecosystem that allows you to compete in these fourth generation services. So uh, again, uh, I don't want to re repeat the, the same mistake of the 700 megahertz. Uh, and I, I think this auction is well designed to, to, uh, to bring maximum revenue. And I hope that uh, uh, we can continue to, to work with FCC as we find our way through the rest of the eligibility rules. And thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, next we have Mark Cooper, who, Mark, I don't know if you can take your microphone out of there and come up here so we see you on camera. Okay, I thought I was on camera over there. Yes. Oh, is he? Oh, okay, you're fine then. Okay, I'm sorry. Wow. This, <laughs> had, you me better, had me stumbling you around, though. Yeah. yeah, we have better AV here in New America than I even knew. Thank you, John. Um, so, um, Mark Cooper from Consumer Federation of America. Well, with a room full of experts, I'm, I want to focus on a little bit on the political economy of this. Uh, although the, the sympathy, uh, the, the sentiment is the same. I mean, the FCC has really come up with a simple and ingenious approach 
to the upcoming auction that balances the multiple objectives under the Communications Act as amended of creating a, uh, it's created a pool for non-dominant fringe competitors and an open pool for all bidders. Uh, and it's simple. If you saw some of the things that were proposed, they got pretty convoluted, right? And so they saw through this and came up with this relatively simple approach. Um, and AT&T's frantic efforts to derail that simple pool approach uh, strikes me as uh, a pretty good evidence that it's a darn good device that the Commission has come up with. Uh, uh, and it certainly does sort of amplify what we have said in our comments uh, to the Commission and the Congress on this issue. First, the fact that AT&T is claiming that it cannot make effective use of low frequency spectrum unless it has access to much more of it when everybody else in the world makes a lot more of it with a lot less is testimony to the gross inefficiency of the dominant carriers. And we stress that in our comments. Second, the fact that AT&T proposes a structure that would squeeze competition into a smaller space uh, than the dominant incumbents is testament, testament to their desire to foreclose and prevent competition. They want the biggest possible scope for foreclosure um, as we argued, that's their primary economic motivation here. Third, their desperation to squeeze the co competitors suggests to us that if the FCC actually stands its ground, the dominant incumbents will have to bid vigorously for whatever spectrum they have access to, and we will have more bidders for more spectrum, spectrum in the aggregate. And so the conclusions of our earlier analysis really do bear repeating at this key moment because someone read the act and the act is, this approach is perfectly consistent with the act as written. Well-crafted pro-competitive auction rules will not only promote the public interest through competition, they can also be expected to generate revenues that equal or exceed revenues that would be expected from auction rules that allow the incumbents to bid for the acquisition of all high quality, low frequency spectrum. If the dominant wireless carriers are allowed to bid on some, but not all of the high quality spectrum, low frequency spectrum uh, will in fact flow to competitors and maximize revenues. This is a really ingenious approach. I want to add one thing. I, I, I don't want to disagree with Chip Pickering. The 20 year old decision to auction spectrum is certainly the most important driver of competition. But this year is also, I believe, the 30th anniversary of an extremely important decision that has driven dynamism in the spectrum. The decision to create what Daryl Issa called yesterday, public access spectrum. That used to be called unlicensed spectrum. I will adopt and accept Daryl Issa's words, and I will never use the word unlicensed again. And the simple observation, when CFA and Daryl Issa agree on something, that ought to be a no-brainer for the FCC. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Um, so, and if we want to have, um, so we, we want to make sure we get to uh, questions uh, f from reporters as quickly as possible. Should we go to that uh, first? Okay. So, so let me start with uh, asking if uh, any of the reporters in the room have have a question, uh, and then we'll and then we're we're already accumulating questions that are coming uh, from those who are tweeting uh, and otherwise and watching the live stream, of course. Um, so, is there any? Uh, yes, right here. And then tell us who you're with, obviously. Hi, <clears throat> Phil Goldstein from Fierce Wireless. Um, if the FCC does approve rules for the incentive auction that are along the lines of what the staff you know, proposal is as we understand it in terms of the set aside. Uh, what do you guys think is the likelihood that AT&T and Verizon, which over the past week have made very plain in ex parte filings that they are not pleased with the direction things are, are going in, um, what do you think is the likelihood that they, you know, either file petitions for reconsideration or any other kind of formal, um, you know, protest to try to get these rules uh, reversed or changed in some way? And you know, how would you guys react to, to anything like that? 
Well, I, let me say that that's clearly the right. Uh, they clearly have an opportunity to do that if, uh, should they so desire. Um, that's their decision. I really don't see where they have uh, uh, much uh, legal ground to stand on on whether or not the FCC exercises its authority uh, properly. So, um, I mean, that's something that they have to consider. We all need six, 600 megahertz spectrum. We'd like to get the spectrum out in the marketplace as soon as possible. Any delay on this side of the of the uh, the, the eligibility uh, and finalization of the rules are going to delay the availability of the spectrum in the marketplace. So um, I would hope that they wouldn't do that. As I said, there's a lot in this uh, structure of this auction for everyone. And, uh, you know, there, there's been at least one of the, the large carriers have cried wolf on more than one occasion. Um, but uh, I think everyone recognizes the need to, to, to participate in the auction. So. Uh, I think speculating what they may or may not do is not very healthy. I, I would just add, I mean, I think this, your, the question's a good one, and it lays bare the contradictions in AT&T's advocacy here. They've told people time and again that low-band spectrum isn't really that important after all. And they also desperately need it as soon as possible. <laughs> so put those two together and see how those add up. Oh, and by the way, if the FCC doesn't assure them a certain take from the auction, they just won't show up, or perhaps they'll try to delay it in some other way. So I just don't get it. I mean, I, I understand what they're driving at. They want everything to flow to them for, quote, unquote, their customers. They're not their customers. They're consumers who need choices. And so I take these threats from AT&T to be, you know, not worth very much, but mainly to show just how self-contradictory they are in all their different uh, tools they're trying to use in this auction to game the system in their favor. Um, I, I would go. I want to go one step further with this. And uh, some of us have heard the chairman in public and in private make the point that he thinks this structure is pretty darn good for the incumbents. And, you, you know, that, and both the wireless incumbents, uh, the dominant incumbents, and also the broadcasters. Um, and uh, I actually agree with him. I'm not sure I would have liked it to end up there, but that's where it is. But I think the important point that both the in incumbents and, and the broadcasters need to under understand is that this may be the high watermark for them. That is, if this doesn't go because they don't come to play or the broadcasters don't come to play, I suggest that the next statute is going to be a lot less friendly to the incumbents because the world outside the incumbents is growing fast. They need spectrum. And I wouldn't be surprised that the next time the Congress is forced to address this if people don't play, the rules are going to be a lot more friendly to the folks in this room than the rules that were written a couple years ago. So I think there's another side to this threat they're playing, but I think it's a very real risk that they're taking if, if they go too far down that path. All right. Uh, Bryce, did you open? Yeah. Uh, Bryce Patrick with Bloomberg DNA. Uh, thanks, thanks for coming. This is a great conversation. Um, I actually just want to touch on something that Mark just said. <clears throat> you mentioned uh, the, the concern that broadcasters may not come to play. And, and that's something that a, a Republican uh, congressional letter um, to Tom Wheeler mentioned. I wonder if you might be able to comment on that, whether these rules might, uh, whether you think these rules might prevent broadcasters from participating. Well, I, I've heard Tom Wheeler <coughs> describe it in the public meetings, and then he's, he's gone and explained it to the folks in this room as well, myself in private meetings. Um, you know, his point is that, um, if you think about a broadcaster who's being offered uh, a range of choices to preserve their business model, to take the money and run, guaranteed to stay in the business with a pocket full of money, how, how is it going to get better for you? Why should you not come in? Now, they may think they can get more money next time. But my point is that, in point of fact, this is the best it will get, in my opinion. Because these people in this room, there's a lot of edge companies who want to get access to it. All those folks may come together. So from my point of view, I think he's, he's properly described the r outrageously friendly offer that's been made to the broadcasters. And if they turn it down, they may get their comeuppance. That's my point. I think this is really good for the broadcasters, I, and I agree with Mark. There's two things going on here. The problem Chairman Wheeler is trying to solve is foreclosure. So AT&T and Verizon don't gobble up 100% of the spectrum. His proposal prevents that from happening. The result of that is not just Sprint and T-Mobile, but DISH and the hundreds of members of CCA will show up for the auction. 
why show up and invest the time in raising capital? Billions of dollars are at stake here uh, if the incumbents can walk away with anything. So the structure, I think, incentivizes more participants. That's the first point. The second point on the revenue is this trigger point that Matt was talking about. The, re the, the reserve only kicks in when the auction has raised sufficient revenue to pay off the broadcasters and to pay for relocation and repacking. And so you're going to generate sufficient revenue before there's any reserve. If re sufficient revenue is not generated, there will be no reserve. That's a really important point. So you're going to have sufficient money to make it a successful auction. And at, and at that point, Chairman Wheeler is proposing we're going to do things to promote competition. We're going to prevent foreclosure. So first, you're solving the revenue issue, and then second, once the revenue issue is solved, the trigger guarantees greater participation uh, for competition. It is, a, it is a critical point that Jeff um, just made that I think gets lost sometimes, is that when you think about the broadcasters, what comes first is a reverse auction. First, the broadcasters say, this is how much money we need, and the commission can then determine a threshold at any level they want. If they want to include what they think they might need for first net, which is probably zero after the auctions, after the AWS three auctions at the end of this year, the commission sets a threshold. Then you go to the forward auction. And this, this trigger for reserve spectrum for competition is never, is never hit, right? It's never triggered unless the commission's threshold is met by the bids of these folks. So, so it's just, uh, you know, it's completely a red herring to think that, that this issue affects broadcasters, any broadcaster, in any way. Because they go first, they say, we need this much money, the commission sets the threshold, these, these carriers decide whether the threshold is hit or not. And this is Greg Whitaker here, and I'd like to also emphasize the point that Jeff made. Um, we represent, Herman, we represent you know, over 100 independent companies, small companies like Sheraton Valley Wireless in Macon, Missouri, or Public Service Wireless in Reynolds, Georgia. And it's critical to have the, the, rule, the competitive rules that will encourage the maximum participation in the auction. And as Jeff said, the, what, what the FCC has proposed, and particularly the adoption of P's, but also avoiding foreclosure in the auction is what it's going to take to encourage those hundreds of independents to show up, which then in turn help to drive the revenue as well as the competition issue critically. We have another um, question here. Um, I do, but let them. Or, yeah, let's, let's get uh, Josh, do you have something online you can relay? Yes. Uh, we have a question from John Egerton of Broadcasting and Cable. AT&T has made the argument that in a data rather than a voice-driven world, low bands beachfront status is mooted by the fact that capacity rather than propagation is the key. Do they have a point? Larry? Do you <laughs> <laughs> no, Larry. Yeah, let me, uh, no, they do not have a point. Uh, it, is, it is beyond question, and, and it's astonishing to they continue to make that argument. It is beyond question that different spectrum bands have very different characteristics. And whether you're doing voice or data, and in fact it's more significant in data, low band spectrum goes further and it goes into buildings better. Everyone knows that. It's a well-established fact of physics. And the result of that is that when you're trying to cover a country as big as this and as diverse as this and rural areas and uh, get in-building penetration so that your phone works in a building and you can make a 911 call in a building, for example, you need low band spectrum. Yes, we're also dealing with capacity now, but still, if you look at the land mass of this country and you look at everybody besides the two dominant carriers, we're all still also dealing with coverage. And coverage is enhanced by low band, not just because it's, it, it makes the coverage, but by needing less infrastructure, your cost structure is more competitive. As we've shown many times, if you take a 700 megahertz site and it covers this area, and then you go to 1.9, you need eight sites to cover it in general. If you go to 2.5, you might need 10 to 13 sites to cover it, or 13 to 15 sites to cover it. The math never crosses over the operating expense of so many more sites to provide the same coverage 
keeps you at a competitive disadvantage. So to argue that in the new world of capacity it doesn't matter is just completely wrongheaded. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just point out that uh, there's another auction coming up, the AWS 3 auction in the fall, that is uh, higher band frequencies. And if AT&T has issues with capacity, go at it. You can bid it for all the spectrum you want in that auction. There's no limits there. If that's the issue with their network, go solve it. I think the low band issue is something uh, unique. Uh, this is the last opportunity for this type of spectrum to be rolled out that any of us are aware of. Uh, and so it's easy for AT&T, when they're sitting on so much low band spectrum, to sit there and say, no problem, you know, don't need it, okay? Well, for uh, T-Mobile to effectively compete in this very large com uh, country where we do need coverage uh, uh, and to be able to, as, as Larry said, build out in a, in a cost-effective way to compete against AT&T and Verizon, low band spectrum is needed. And so I think uh, we don't uh, doubt that AT&T may have some capacity issues and they need high band spectrum. Go for it. Uh, go out and buy it. There's plenty of it coming up for sale. This just be one my note my one note for today I guess which is it for AT and T low band spectrum is now moot or they need a 20 megahertz chunk handed to them or else they won't even show up at the auction I they should argue with themselves first and maybe figure that out and then come back to the rest of us I mean, I, I mean the industry members are a little bit too polite here let's be clear <laughs> AT <laughs> AT and T always does things on the cheap until either competition or regulators force them to make the investment in infrastructure. So when we looked at their when we looked at their build out, they underinvested in towers, dumped their traffic into into unlicensed. First ones to do that. Everyone now has discovered that they were the first ones to do that. They dramatically reduced their investment in towers and infrastructure per subscriber at exactly the moment broadband was coming. Some of us say they did the same thing in the Uverse space, and later on realized they had to pull some more fiber. The simple fact of the matter is that that's what they always say. That's what's in their economic interest. And unless someone, either a regulator or a competitor, stands up to them, they will get away with that stuff. We have the next question online. Sure. Um, from Howard Buskirk of Com Com Daily. To what extent do you expect to see competitive carriers take part in the auction? And are there any remaining policy decisions that could limit participation? Well, um, tough question, Howard. Uh, I, I fully expect every competitive carrier to want to get access to this ecosystem. I mean, it's not just about spectrum. It's about getting into an ecosystem that allows you to compete in this new generation of services. And everyone's going to have to have Volte. I mean, we talked about the efficiency of spectrum. Well, the, the efficiency of the fourth generation technology is also five times more efficient. So. Uh, I think the competitive carriers are going to show up, and thank goodness with the structure of the auction, you have PEAs, you have carriers that want to bid in the footprint of, the, of their current coverage area, and they have an opportunity now to, to do that and, and win. So I think they're going to show up. Uh, you know, obviously, did we get everything we wanted? No. I'd love to see a national market screen, uh, dominant power, so that every small carrier can bid and spectrum in their own you know, footprint. That would, uh, I would like to see that. Uh, we're, there are a few exceptions out there that uh, under the current rules that uh, doesn't quite uh, fit. But I think it's, uh, it, they're going in the right direction, and I, I think it will be a successful auction. Um, and especially for the small carrier that has to, to avoid uh, uh, getting into a, a, a trap of not having partners to roam with and infrastructure and devices. And I think uh, they've done a good job of making sure we have interoperable spectrum and, and leaving those opportunities for the competitors. I, it, I would reverse the question and say, you know, AT&T has in particular done everything they could to really undermine this auction and are continuing to do that. They've pushed for less spectrum in the auction. They have opposed any sort of reasonable competitive limits. And so I think, you know, really, uh, AT&T, I think, uh, would like to really see this auction fail. And um, 
we're up here saying, no, we don't want it to fail. Uh, we think the commission's come up with uh, a reasonable construct uh, and uh, that, you know, the, the point of which is to attract broad participation in the auction. That's what's going to make for a successful auction. Not an auction where just AT&T show up, but an auction where more than AT&T uh, and Verizon show up. Lots more. Yes. <clears throat> so some policies that uh, we've been briefed that the c commission is considering in addition to the auction specific rules are some changes to the overall spectrum aggregation policies. Uh, and it's definitely a cause of concern for me at least that uh, you would start counting more high bandwidth spectrum at, you know, towards the denominator of the screen, counting it towards the screen without applying a discount that takes into account the, 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 the different uh, value of the different bands that we're talking about before. Because that would make it seem like if you're a carrier, you know, a Sprint is the obvious example, uh, that has a lot of high bandwidth spectrum. It makes it hard. It makes it makes you look worse for the purposes of the screen, which could not only discourage your participation in this auction, but in future auctions, without also getting the benefit of having the spectrum that the other carriers have. So that's an item for concern for me, as well as you know the vague statements that the commission has made on the sub one gigahertz. Uh, uh, cap or enhancement factors issue. So, well, I'm con you know, we have this auction, but we also have to consider making trade-offs with spectrum aggregation that could apply to future auctions as well. And this is going to occur again. And, you know, we see tremendous interest from the competitive carriers. My expectation is that they will certainly be showing up in mass if the commission gets this right. Uh, there's no more important competitive policy or factor though for the small carriers than getting the geographic area the size of that correct. And so uh, we certainly want to see the P proposal adopted and the CCA D proposal adopted. There's no more, no more critical factor for us. But the FCC gets that correct as it appears they are, then I expect to see great interest. We certainly also like to see the national trigger applied as well for a few of the situations. Okay. Uh, that, no, that's it. Um, <laughs> so uh, Phil, right here. Yeah. Going back to, to John's point, um, there's this sense that I get that the FCC has tried to do a little kind of two-step, as they sometimes do, between the uh, incentive auction rules and the spectrum holdings proceeding with the spectrum screen. On the one hand, the incentive auction rules seem to really benefit competitive carriers uh, by having this, um, you know, set aside. Uh, on the other hand, as John was saying, um, you know, with the spectrum screen, they've contemplated adding quite a bit of Sprint's 2.5 gigahertz spectrum, the spectrum that DISH controls now. Um, and, you know, that seems to, you know, potentially benefit AT&T and Verizon in the future in terms of, you know, what the headroom is for, for future transactions. So, you know, I just would like, you know, either Sprint or DISH or anybody on the, the panel to comment about whether or not you think the FCC is trying to split the baby here. You know, I'll just say to start with, if you're, if the commission's goal is to basically, you know, pay off, a, not pay off, but counterbalance what you're doing for AT&T to get them to accept the whole package, I mean, it doesn't work. They'll just fight everything. So it doesn't really matter what other good things you give to AT&T, because if there's like the tiniest little detail that they're not happy with, they'll, they'll fight you on it. I, I, let me take it a little different way. Um, that's a good point. But uh, certainly we don't think that the way the Commission is proposing to do the screen is, is the optimum out, uh, outcome. Um, the Commission has very clearly identified that, as we were t discussing earlier, different spectrum bands have different characteristics. Low band is particularly important competitively, yet the proposed screen treats all spectrum the same. Uh, that just seems to fly in the face of the record and, and really of the economic arguments underlying the auction. So we certainly think that the Commission should treat different bands differently. I don't quibble with adding more spectrum to the screen going forward as additional bands are available uh, for broadband use, but their utility in a broadband network and their cost to make them useful in a broadband network affect their competitive impact. And the screen is all about being a diagnostic tool to identify when does aggregation create or, or present a competitive concern that warrants further competitive scrutiny. And I think the proposed screen loses its effectiveness 
to the extent it, it has any left, it, it, it doesn't get any more effective and perhaps worse at doing that job. So while I would certainly agree the overall auction framework is very well thought out and innovative and brought to its logical conclusion could really stimulate competition and additional competitors getting critical low band spectrum, I, I do think they've missed the boat on the screen and we hope they'll rethink that. Mm -hmm. to the spectrum holdings proceeding? I can't say. Uh, we and others are certainly suggesting it, and, and hopefully as they think about the overall package and the integrity of the overall package uh, and the different puts and takes in the package, that that, that would be uh, the outcome. And I, and I would say that the predictive value of the screen could actually be enhanced if you had, for example, three buckets that you weighted differently uh, to reflect the you know utilization and uh, I hope that they take a look at it and, and uh, uh, consider modifications. As, as you probably know, we have filed a number of uh, filings recently on the three-bucket concept, which is really a simplification or a condensing down of our original proposal, which had a weighting for every band that's available in broadband. And we've suggested that the three-bucket, uh, low, medium, and high, low, mid, and high, actually would be a nice simplification. It's, it's very transparent, very simple to apply, and it's a terrific outgrowth of the Commission's own rhetoric in the competition reports, in recent analysis of other transactions, in, in notices of proposed rulemaking, in which it consistently says that wireless broadband carriers should have a mix of low, mid, and high band spectrum, taking advantage of the different capabilities and intrinsic physics of each to best serve their customers. So, you know, we think that would make a lot of sense and it would balance really the screen. Your headroom result would be very reasonable. No one would be foreclosed t from uh, doing additional transactions in the future. Uh, everyone would have some headroom to do them in the future, but a large transaction would, as it should, uh, trigger uh, a more in-depth competitive review by virtually any carrier and then the Commission can go through the many factors it looks at. At the end of the day the Commission looks at many factors and reaches a public interest determination of whether the benefits of the proposed transaction outweigh potential harms of the proposed transaction. So we think that would make a much better screen and, and a better result. At this point we believe the best outcome would be if the other four commissioners would force the spectrum holdings proceeding back to the drawing board. It should be removed from the agenda. I mean, it really is not useful, you know, as proposed. I mean, as John uh, said earlier, um, they should not be adding mid-band spectrum to the denominator of a screen to benefit Verizon and AT&T um, without uh, adding weightings uh, to that. It's just um, not a good approach. And, you know, and it's so vague uh, as far as enhancement factors and other things that it's almost a meaningless uh, exercise. So w we hope that they would draw, you know, withdraw that uh, item and, and, and really revisit and do something that's meaningful for competition. Uh, I think from T-Mobile's standpoint, um, we you know, to the extent that they're integrated with the auction rules, uh, and we'll see on May 15th, I think we would uh, prefer to see the Spectrum Holdings uh, matter go forward and, uh, and not upset the apple cart of any of the uh, actions around the, um, around the incentive auction rules. So, but I understand uh, some of the current concerns that have been raised. Okay. Uh, do we have another question online? Two, two questions from Paul Kirby of TR Daily. Um, one, are you getting any, any traction on the suggestion that the FCC should reserve 40 or even more megahertz per market for reserve bidding? And second, do you think you'll be successful in your proposal that the FCC adopt, adopt both local and national spectrum aggregation threshold triggers? Well, let me, let me uh, address the second one first. Um, I hope that they will uh, adopt both the national and the and local trigger, and uh, I think it makes a lot of sense, especially uh, especially since some of the pundits of AT&T is suggesting that um, the, the the auction is not constructed in a way that would uh, inure to the benefit of rural America, and it's 
you know, it's sort of it's tiresome, and if not uh, uh, tiring to hear those re re pundits of the of the of AT and T that this doesn't help rural America, uh, when in fact uh, it um, structure the, st the structure itself is. We couldn't ask for a better uh, economic, I mean, a geographic uh, build uh, other than CMAs. So I think that uh, if you have both, uh, AT&T is going to uh, find, and, and I don't think you've heard AT&T say this anywhere, that they actually get to bid on two-thirds of the reserve spectrum under this the proposal uh, that we would propose, uh, not a national and a local uh, screen. Um, and uh, like Kathleen said, they can go for it if, at, if they need more spectrum in those markets. But, you know, to hold the rural uh, card hostage to uh, promote a uh, um, uh, policy benefit, immediate policy benefit from at and is, is uh, uh, like I say, we've heard it before. I mean, they've had since 1984 to build out rural America if they wanted to really do it. And uh, we represent uh, 100 wireless carriers that are actually out there building it out providing service to the customers and consumers in rural America. Um, and I think that's uh, sort of the uh, proof is in the pudding there. And just there's a scenario where AT&T Verizon could actually walk away with all of the spectrum. If no one else bids and the trigger's hit and there's no one else bidding, AT&T Verizon could walk away with 100% of all 600 megahertz. Uh, it's only when the trigger's met Revenue is sufficiently generated that the reserve comes into play. And AT&T doesn't seem to acknowledge that scenario, but that could happen. I, don't, I hope it doesn't. I hope a lot of people show up. And I think uh, because of what Chairman Wheeler is proposing, a lot of people will show up as a result. And you look at it, door A is what AT&T wants. Unrestricted, they could foreclose and buy all of it with no competitive protections. Door B is what Chairman Wheeler has proposed. And I think common sense, history, look at other auctions around the world, door B is the more successful auction. More people will show up. The broadcasters will end up getting more money. It will be good for competition. AT&T Verizon will walk away still with a lot of spectrum, uh, but they won't walk away with all of it. I think that's good policy. Phil, you um, so, Kathleen, you mentioned earlier that AT&T can just go ahead and participate in the AWS3 auction, which has no restrictions in terms of reserve bidding if they really care about capacity. Um, there's been this sense that, okay, you know, AWS3 will produce a whole lot of revenue that will take care of FirstNet's funding requirements, and that will relieve pressure on the FCC to make sure that revenue from the incentive auction um, you know, covers those requirements. I'm just curious to get, um, you know, either your sense or Steve's sense or Larry's sense about whether or not, um, you know, competitive carriers view the 600 megahertz auction as the auction to participate in as opposed to AWS3. Well, I think both auctions, we've been very active. T-Mobile's been very active. It's Steve Sharkey in the back of the room. He's the guy who single-handedly uh, has been uh, working on this uh, <laughs> for T-Mobile. But we've been working actually very well with Verizon and AT&T on that proceeding. There's, there's a lot of uh, issues there around clearing the federal government users. And, uh, uh, you know, the spectrum also happens to be adjacent to the existing AWS-1 ban. So there, I think there's a lot of opportunity there for uh, people to participate to, you know, achieve some of the things that at and is worried about, which is capacity. So I think you'll see some healthy participation uh, in that auction. And indeed, I think, uh, you know, it has to hit certain thresholds in order to clear the federal government users. Uh, and uh, I think that auction is, uh, many believe will make uh, sufficient spectrum to meet all the first net needs and that that problem will be solved with that auction. Uh, the low band uh, spectrum auction presents other opportunities and again I think uh, low band spectrum uh, for all the reasons that have been put in the record that I don't think AT&T and Verizon can deny and even Verizon runs ads uh, saying this the benefits of, of uh, low band spectrum in terms of coverage and also in terms of indoor penetration. There's a reason why public safety, for example, likes uh, low band spectrum. Uh, there's a reason why 
your television set works indoors. Uh, as we push more and more uh, uh, data usage uh, through our networks and people want to view video and data indoors, uh, low band spectrum also becomes important for that purpose. So uh, very critically important for competition and so uh, very unique spectrum. Uh, there's really no other opportunity like it on the horizon. So I think Yes, I think you'll see a lot of uh, interest in that in that auction, and I think you'll especially see interest given the uh, framework that the FCC's come up with here. Sir, yeah, we should. We're at uh, the hour. Um, unless there's, is there any other reporter question right now? Then, yeah, then I think we should wrap it up so that we uh, stay on schedule. And I want to thank. Uh, uh, thank the press who who attended both uh, in the room and online as well as all our our speakers um, so thank you very much <laughs>